So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, online seminar. So uh, unfortunately, uh, Thomas Galvani uh, got uh, a positive test, the COVID this morning. So that's why we, we had to, to make this, this presentation online, although it's, it's not very far <laughs> in the Hotel Exe campus. Um, so Thomas uh, is a theoretician. He will present uh, us his work, his thesis work. He did on on uh, on exciton physics in uh, hexagonal bone nitride. So he obtained his PhD uh, from the University of, of Luxembourg on this topic, and uh, yeah, he had a lot of collaboration also with some uh, French uh, researchers at Onera. And they uh, they developed, I think, uh, one of the first uh, study combining DFT and um, anti-banning, very and the elaboration of the type banning uh, basis for exciton in two dimensional materials is a very interesting point because uh, because we know that exciton in two dimensional materials have uh, characteristics unprecedented characteristics and so the the understanding of this um, um, let's say uh, many body particles these uh, electron hole pairs is a, is a very important for, for physics, for fundamental research, and also for future application. So um, we, we don't have, I mean, if you are uh, participating, you don't have the access to, um, to the microphone. So you can ask questions in the chat during the, during the talk of Thomas. OK, do not hesitate. And at the end, you can also raise your hand. And I will, uh, so we will open the, Oh, I'm sorry. If you raise your hand, maybe I have to give you, okay. I will allow you to talk, okay? If I see you raise your hand. So you can do both. Question on the fly, and then at the end of the presentation, raise your hand and I will allow you, I will somehow unlock your microphone. Okay, so thank you, Thomas, for, for visiting us. Despite this circumstance, uh, it's good to have you in Barcelona. And uh, now the floor is yours. So please, looking forward to listen to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. I mean, it's uh, there's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I guess the screen is not uh, correctly shared. Okay, that's fine. That's not matter. So yeah, thank you for your uh, unfailing hospitality. Uh, I wish I could be here to to discuss with you all in person, but sadly that's uh, a little bit difficult at the moment. Um, so yeah, um, today I'd like to discuss with you um, the problem of excitons in, in two-dimensional semiconductors, more precisely in the context of uh, hexagonal boron nitride, which I believe is a, a prototypical system for this, from the point of view of, um, of real space methods, more precisely the tight burning approximation. Perhaps a bit of a dramatis personae, uh, as has been said, as been a lot of interest in 2D materials for the last 10, 20 years, maybe. Um, the most well-known of which is probably graphene, um, which is a honeycomb lattice of uh, carbon atoms and a semi-metal, famously. Um, the one I'd like to discuss today is its close cousin, and its boron nitride. So BN is uh, also a honeycomb system like graphene, but instead of A and B carbon atoms, you have boron and nitrogen atoms. And because they have widely different electronegativities, HBN is instead a wide band gap semiconductor, most of whose optical activity is in the ultraviolet range. So um, you can see on the, um, on the left, uh, the band structure of this system, which you can see look, looks much like graphene with a mass term. Um, when I say wide band gap, I mean about seven, eight electron volts in the single layer. And what you can see on the right is the absorption spectrum of this system. So basically what frequencies, what energies of photons are absorbed when you shine a laser, laser through it. What's remarkable, and it's a characteristic of most 2D semiconductors, is that almost all the optical activity occurs below the band gap. And if you think in terms of single particle physics, this is a bit surprising because normally when you find light, you send a photon in a system, you have a probability to excite an electron from the balance of the conduction band. And uh, this means that basically you can only excite uh, or absorb photons which have an energy which is above that of the band gap. 
But as you can see in HBN, this basically doesn't happen. Things only occur below the band gap. So the answer to the question of why is that nature is not single particle. Um, in reality, when you excite an electron to the conduction, then it leaves behind a hole, which is positive quasi-particle, and the hole and the electron, they interact uh, through the Conor interaction, and therefore they create bound states, pretty much like a hydrogen atom would. More precisely, what occurs is that the, the single particle transitions are no longer uh, good quantum states. K is no longer a good quantum number. So this interaction creates a mixing of uh, transitions, which give rise to these discrete uh, energy levels inside the gap. And these are the exciton levels. These discrete levels give rise to the discrete absorption peaks. So, as I said, the main interest in 2D materials, or one of the main interest in 2D systems, is because they have novel optoelectronic properties. But these effects, they are strongly dominated by uh, bound electron hole pairs. And this is why there's, I believe, a need for simple models which can provide physical insights on these effects. And I'd like to show you one such model for boron nitride. Further, the technological dream kind of, of, of 2D systems is to stack them like Lego bricks to, produ to produce new metamaterials with new properties for applications. But this begs many questions, such as how these excitons behave when you actually stack layers, how the excitonic peaks that you have in one system are modified when you have more than one layer, and what you can learn from it also from a characterization point of view. If you look at the flake, uh, how many layers, what do you see, and perhaps what can you get from the spectrum if you don't know what's under the microscope. And these are the points I'd like to, to discuss today. As kind of a um, spoiler, you can see here the absorption spectra for single, double, triple, and penta layer of HBN. And as you can see, although it's always dominated by one, by one main peak, we'll explain why. Uh, as you go further in layers, this, this peak uh, alone acquires quite an untrivial fine structure. And uh, I'll try to show you, to convince you that there's a lot of information which is already contained in this structure. So we'll start by explaining perhaps the basis of exciton physics, how we compute them and uh, what kind of models are available. Then we'll move to the, the meat of the talk, which I think is the, the time bounding model for uh, HBN single layers, so a model which is not very complex, but allows one to extract a lot of physics and then show what we can do with this model, which is, for example, computation and dispersion. So what's in, what's in direct absorption when you have excitons, for example, and uh, extend this model as I teased to uh, multi-layers. Theoretical background. Um, excitonic states, as I said, we usually write as in our combinations of uh, transitions from balance to conduction bands. You create a, you destroy an electron in the valence band, so you create a hole, and you create the corresponding electron up. Now, the states we're interested in are the ones which are the, the excitons themselves. They are the eigenstates of the so-called beta salpeter effective Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian is in two parts. The first is the so-called kinetic Hamiltonian is basically the kinetic energy uh, in the hydrogen uh, analogy. It contains the transition energies and it's diagonal in K space. If you know the single particle properties, you know this. Now the fun and the difficulty comes from the interaction term. Here I show only the direct interaction term. This is the two body parts of the problem. And uh, I mean, I only, I only show this integral to show that basically this is a complicated term to evaluate in K space. You need to know many things, not least among which the uh, screened Coulomb potential. So this is hard to calculate in general. How do you solve this equation? Well, one very useful way is to solve it by so-called ab initio methods. The idea is that you compute all the ingredients that I've shown you before from first principle, and then you solve this, uh, you diagonalize this Hamiltonian numerically. This is great because it's very general, it requires no parameters, it's predictive, but it's quite expensive uh, computationally. You usually need one of these things, a uh, high performance computing center, and also because it's uh, heavy numerical work, it's sometimes hard to interpret. It can be a bit black box. Uh, I'll be showing a lot of such calculations in this work, um, most of which uh, are the, the work of my uh, as well colleague, Fulvio Paleari, using the quantum espresso and Yambo codes. 
on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, uh, there are also analytical methods to solve this, uh, this problem. If you have a system for which the electron hole interaction is relatively weak, which is typically the case in classical uh, 3D semiconductors, then you can imagine that the ball radius, the electron hole separation, is going to be very large. So you can probably average out the lattice effects. This amounts to making the effective mass approximation and replacing uh, your system by a kind of a homogeneous uh, medium. And if you do this, you can actually transform the beta cell beta equation into an effective uh, hydrogenoid equation. This is the so-called Vanier model. And in a 3D semiconductor, well, the electron hole interaction you can easily model using a Coulomb potential with some screening. And then this is the, the standard uh, Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom. So you get a read back series of bound states, which give rise to the discrete actinonic peaks, etc. And this works fairly well um, in 3D at least. But in two dimensions, things are a little bit more complicated, and this for two reasons. The first uh, comes from the, the kinetic energy itself. Um, in 2D, there's this confinement. The electron and the hole, they're confined in a two-dimensional plane, which changes the, the Laplacian. And if you've already solved the, the 2D hydrogen atom, you know that the, uh, the lowest bound state is four times more bound in 2D than in 3D, for example. So you expect much more strongly bound excitons. And this effect is compounded by the uh, electron hole potential itself. Because in 2D, the screening is much weaker than in 3D, chiefly because if you have just a thin sheet uh, of matter to screen your electron hole interaction, most of the field lines actually go through vacuum. So there's almost no screening. So again, this means that the electrons are more uh, concentrated, they're more bound, the ball radius is smaller. And so the assumptions of the, uh, the Vanier model are more questionable. This means that there's a need to actually develop models which take into account the lattice structure of the system. And this is exactly what we propose to do. So how do we, sorry, how do we construct uh, a simple Vanier-like model uh, which accounts for the, the geometry of the crystal? One way to do so uh, is to construct a minimal type binding model, for example, for Bn here. This is just like graphene, except with on-site energies. Uh, we introduce a probability of hopping from boron to nitrogen. We consider only piezo orbitals. And with this minimum model, you can actually construct the electronic structure of boron nitride. You can do various fits, but what matters is that you can reproduce fairly well the, uh, the low energy region, the low energy transitions, which are the most important for the, the optical properties. Once you've done this, you can look at the projected density of states and then something interesting occurs. You will see, if you do this, that most of the valence band states uh, are nearly pure nitrogen orbitals. And likewise, most of the conduction band states that come nearly purely from boron orbitals. This is because nitrogen is much more electronegative than boron. So from a chemistry point of view, this makes a lot of sense. Nitrogen makes the, the LUMO, uh, sorry, the HOMO, and uh, boron constructs the, the LUMO. If you know graphene, uh, there's a further plot point, which is that at the K point, where you have normally the direct cone in graphene, uh, because the two A and B sublattices decouple, well, the same occurs in boron nitride. The two sublattices, nitrogen and boron, they couple exactly. So this approximation that the valence band is nearly purely nitrogen and the conduction band nearly purely boron is actually a very good approximation. It is also a very useful approximation. You can use it in the following way. If you start from excitons, which are transitions from valence to conduction bands, you can say, well, the valence band, I can rewrite as a tight binding basis state for nitrogen, and the conduction band as a tight binding basis state for boron. But then these basis states themselves, I can expand into their constituent atomic orbitals. And this makes manifest a new uh, basis, if you will, a new set of states, which are localized electron hole pairs, which within our approximations naturally span the, the set of, of, of um, excitonic spaces. So you, can, you have one such pair depicted here. Um, if you have defects, you must stop here. But if your crystal is perfect, if you have transitional invariance, you can think, well, all of these pairs which share the same uh, relative coordinates, the same R, are transitionally equivalent. 
So we could create a block wave out of them. We could do type binding on top of the type binding. And this is what we do. We uh, create these, uh, these effective block states, which I like to call elementary excitations. And we can seek the direct excitons of the system in this basis. So the advantage of this is that we, in a way, we combine the, the, the real space, um, but without having to consider a Hamiltonian with a dimension which is twice that of the crystal. If you use this basis, you recast the beta salpeta equation in it, you will find two things. The first is that the Bayes states themselves, they're labeled by vectors, which form a natural lattice. So these elementary excitations, they, they form actually a triangular lattice. Each of these points you can think of as a basis vector. And if you rewrite the Hamiltonian in this basis, you will find that it becomes an impurity type binding problem. More precisely, the kinetic part of the Hamiltonian is no longer diagonal, but it's not very complicated. It's just, it just describes the motion of a fictitious particle on this triangular lattice. And the electron hole interaction, which was complicated before, now becomes diagonal. It's just an external field which represents the electron hole interaction. You can think of it for monolayers as kind of fixing the hole somewhere on a hexagon and just letting the electron move around. So to close this, this problem, we just need now to model in some way uh, these uh, matrix elements of the potential. So I don't want to spend too long on this, but one way to do this, uh, which work fairly, works fairly well, is to use the so-called ritova keldish potential. Um, this is because the one of the Arcunon potential is not very, uh, not very accurate for two-dimensional systems. And this occurs because if you take your electron and your hole very far away, there's almost no screening, as you mentioned before. But if you take them closer, to clo closer and closer together, then um, all the field lines basically go through the two-dimensional system and you have a 2D electrostatic problem. So you expect a logarithmic divergence by Gauss's law. And the ritova kellish potential basically interpolates between these two behaviors by modeling the system as an infinitely thin dielectric sheet. So on with this, we have closed the problem and we can finally compute excitons. So I'd like to show you results. But first, we need to understand how to represent results. Because excitonic wave functions, they have this small problem that they are inherently uh, six-dimensional objects. So they don't really fit uh, on the whiteboard. You can see here, the, it depends on the electron position, which is 3D, and the whole position as well. So this is a 6D object. One solution which works well for monolayers is to fix the hole on an electronegative atom for us and nitrogen, and look at the surrounding electronic density. You see here the lowest bound wave function for the, um, the single layer HBN type. Results. You can see here a comparison between the initial computed wave functions and the tight binding ones in real space. We obtain actually fairly, uh, fairly good agreements. But one thing which is nice if you have a tight binding model is that you can work in real space and you can easily extract the phases of the wave function. It allows you to do a symmetry analysis and to compute in a very simple way, uh, these electron rules for the excitons. So you can find, for example, that only the states which transform as the so-called E representations are actually bright. And this allows you to assign, to know which one is which peak. You can also show analytically that the oscillator strength of these states, how bright they are, is proportional to the intensity, uh, the electronic intensity on the first nearest neighbors of the whole. So this explains why this guy is actually the main uh, peak, the main feature in the absorption spectrum of HBN. It is actually closely analogous to the, the classical Elliot theory, except for tight binding. We can go one step further and we can Fourier transform uh, all of this to look at the reciprocal phase wave functions. So this is useful. And tight binding once again allows us to, to, to compute the phases, um, which is interesting because if you think in terms of hydrogenoid excitons, you know what phase structure you expect in the neighborhood of the uh, high intensity K and K prime points. For, a, for an S state, for example, for a hydrogen S state, you expect a constant phase. And indeed, this is what you, what you see on the lowest bound exciton, constant phase around the K point. For a P state, you expect to see a phase that rotates once by two pi around each point. This is what you see, for example, here. 
But if you look at the state which is responsible for the second peak, something interesting occurs because, well, it seems to be predominantly of P character, but also there's here a clear sign of S uh, character. This is not surprising when you think about it. Boron nitride is, is not a hydrogen-like system. It does not have full circular symmetry. It has triangular symmetry. So the S, P, D, et cetera, classification, while useful, is not exact. So this is very much a mixed state, and it's not the only one. And this explains why it is actually a bright state, while the classical Elliot theory would predict it dark. In fact, if we try to sum up what we've seen, uh, if we model no HBN simply using the hydrogenoid model, we find basically, uh, well, like the, hydrogen, like the hydrogen situation, one main peak, and then a cluster of S and P states, which we know from before is not what we actually see. But we could think, oh, well, this is just because I have forgotten to use the Coulomb, the Kalish potential. If I do this, the, the accidental degeneracy goes away, and the state splits. But wait, we know that these states are supposed to both be split and be bright. So what's missing? Well, the missing ingredient, as you might have guessed, is the lattice structure of the system, which is what type binding captures. Then you can actually obtain the correct splitting of the states going from the uh, circular symmetry to the actual triangular symmetry and find the correct second peak, if you will. So it is in this way that one can analyze the, the absorption spectrum, the unique absorption spectrum of the system and disentangle in a way what is due to the, the standard, the continuous uh, contributions and to the discrete uh, lattice nature. So this is the part of the presentation now having said this, where I mentioned that I kind of pulled the fast one on you. Until now, we have only talked about direct transitions, which makes sense because in the dipole approximation, only these can be bright. Photons are valid momentum, so you cannot excite diagonally. But of course, uh, in a real system, the lattice can vibrate. You can have phonons, you can have disorder. And so indirect transitions are technically possible and can have a big influence on the spectrum of the system. What is remarkable is that the momentum difference between uh, the hole and the electron, this, this Q here, is actually a good quantum number. So we can do exactly the same thing that we did before, except writing the excitons as a linear combination of indirect transition of a given uh, center of mass momentum Q. It is actually not so difficult. Uh, this just modifies the hopping structure. Uh, and if you do so, you will find that exciton dispersion comes from basically two effects. The first is kinetic. It comes from the band structure and it's responsible for, uh, at low Q, the quadratic dispersion. It gives excitons an effective mass, if you will. Uh, it gives them a matter-like behavior. But there's also a contribution to exciton dispersion which comes from the interaction terms, specifically exchange. Exchange interaction is the other part of the electron interaction. It's a repulsive part. And you can show that it has a linear behavior. It gives rise to linear dispersion at low values of Q. And this is quite typical of what occurs in 2D semiconductors. So this you can express in type binding easily. You can do the calculation. I show you here quickly the results. On the left, I've been issued on the right type binding. The agreement for such a simple model is fairly, is fairly good. Um, and as I mentioned, you can see here, for example, the lowest bound exciton on mono HBN split as soon as you go away from zone center into what some people call a matter-like exciton with an effective mass and a so-called light-light exciton, which disperses linearly. And this is due to exchange contribution. In the tight binding model, of course, you can investigate, uh, you can vary parameters, you can investigate what long range hoppings do. Uh, you can vary the strength of bias um, parameters. But I, I don't really want to go into the, the details of this in the interest of time. What I will mention quickly in passing is that you can do the same thing, of course, for bulk systems. Um, and in bulk HBN, this is very much a plot point physically uh, because bulk HBN has an indirect band gap and it has been shown that its excitons are also indirect. You can see here the, the dispersion of uh, excitons in bulk HBN along the gamma k direction. This is actually very relevant for luminescence experiments, for example, because in luminescence, you shoot electron hole pairs up, 
then they relax to the lowest uh, point of the exciton band structure, which would not be uh, gamma here, but would be somewhere along the gamma K line. Um, so this is a reason why we, we care very much about these indirect excitons. This is because they, they have a signature which you can see uh, and is actually the main signature uh, in, in luminescence, uh, cathode luminescence experiments, for example. Um, since many people here like transport, I, I mentioned also in passing that uh, if you look at the curvatures, you see that uh, excitons have a significantly higher effective mass than the corresponding free electron hole pairs, which makes sense because you have to move both the electron and the hole, you have to drag them both together instead of just moving them independently. Um, by the way, if you're interested in, the, in this, this problem of uh, luminescence in bulk HBN, uh, there's ample literature on the topic. I give you here a few, uh, a few articles. So, having talked now quickly about single layer and bulk, I'd like to address the situation in between that I teased at the beginning. What happens when we have a finite flake, a flake of finite thickness? Well, the simple flake of finite thickness perhaps is the one with two layers. So uh, we'll discuss here the so-called AA prime stacking of boron nitride with the nitrogens on top of the boron. Chemically, this is one of the most stable ones. But there are many other polymorphs, which uh, in passing, uh, I mentioned that we can treat also in tight binding on equal footing. But I will only discuss here AA prime because it's the most stable. So this here is its absorption spectrum. And if you look very closely and you're a theoretician, you can look at all the states. Um, you will find that the first peak is actually not the lowest bound exciton. The lowest bound exciton is a dark state which cannot couple with light, um, which is situated a little bit below, 30 milliectron volts below to be precise. And you can do the trick of putting the, the hole on one of the layers, looking at the electron density, and the bright one looks like this, the dark one looks like this, which is to say basically exactly the same. This might be a bit confusing at first, but I think it's easily cleared up when you think about the, the H2 molecule, if you take a molecular point of view. Indeed, you can imagine to have two, um, two boron nitride sheets far away together in such a way that they do not interact. Then each of them can have a copy of the 1S exciton on them. And when you bring them closer together, just like a dehydrogen molecule, you expect a bonding and an anti-bonding state. Exactly the same thing happens with excitons. The splitting is basically the splitting between the bonding and anti-bonding uh, excitonic states, which descend from the lowest bond monolayer state. The bonding state um, is even, and because this system has inversion symmetry, it therefore must be dark, it cannot couple with light, while the odd state can be bright, and indeed it is, it's the first peak. You can check this by doing the full calculation. Um, here you see the side view. Uh, again, here we have to be careful with how we plot excitons because they are still 6D. Um, what we do here is that we put the uh, hole on one layer and then another hole uh, on uh, the inverse position in the other layer. Only then do you have the a representation of the full wave function. Here you can see the tight binding phases again. Um, the tight binding model does not require such whole placing tricks, but here I, I do it for viewing convenience. You can see very clearly that the lowest bound state is actually even, therefore dark, while the odd state is uh, odd, that's bright. The kind of uh, Davidoff, pairs, uh, Davidoff pair analysis can be extended to most of the lowest energy excitons of the uh, of the bilayer boron, uh, uh, that, sorry, the bilayer um, HBN. And I just wanted to show you here the case of uh, out of plane pairs. That is to say, pairs where the electron and the hole are on different layers. Um, these states, I, I like to mention, they're usually dark um, when you shine light from the, the top of the sample. But if you're very skilled and you manage to somehow light, uh, shine the light from the side, these states will actually be the ones responsible for most of the optical activity. And they're also kind of important for experiments such as the excitons on rails, uh, because they're usually rather long-lived. So, having discussed the bilayer in this kind of uh, molecular view, uh, what can we say about increasing the number of layers? We see that the situation becomes more complex, but still, it seems that there's a Davidoff splitting going on, 
Um, but if you look at the pentan layer, it is not simply uh, the H5 molecule. Uh, it seems that we have two substructures, one at low energy, one at high energy. And uh, in this high energy substructure, so this guy, um, it seems that there's further some fine structure. So this is what I'd like to now uh, discuss with you. It cannot be done analytically, but uh, perhaps it's better explained with a cartoon. Um, the, the molecular idea again is that we will start from a collection of completely decoupled boron nitride layers. And imagine that on each of them, there's uh, one, uh, one S exciton. And we'll seek the, uh, the excitons of the flake as linear combinations of these monolayer excitons. To first order, the, the first perturbation to this uh, otherwise uninteracting system um, is as follows. First, on the surfaces, the atoms have lower coordination numbers. And you can show uh, in, in the type binding formalism that this means that the pairs on the surfaces have lower kinetic energy, which means that the excitons there are more bound. They are lower in energy. Further, if you think in terms of screening, you expect the excitons on the surfaces to be also less screened. This is because there's vacuum here, while here there's bulk, there's matter to actually screen the electron hole interaction. So these two effects, they conspire to make the surface excitons lower in energy than the excitons that comes from the inside. This explains these two subspaces. If we now go to second order, we can reintroduce the interlayer hopping. And then the excitons can actually move from one layer to the other. This occurs by going through the out of plane states, such as the ones I sh I've shown you before. The hole moves first, creating an interlayer state, and then the electron, or vice versa. This basically grants some fine structure to the system um, and completes, in a way, uh, the explanation of the splitting of the, the lowest down peak. We can turn this cartoon into, in, into mathematics, into an actual model. And um, making the story short, you can basically show that the splitting of the first peak in a boron nitride flake can be described as a, as a linear chain problem with boundary effects. And in general, these boundary effects, one can show they are pretty large on the order of 100 milli electron volts compared to the interlayer coupling, which is more like 15. And so you expect a decoupling into surface excitons and bulk excitons. You can use this model to actually compute uh, the splitting analytically. And you find that the, among the surface stages, uh, one's actually bright, one interacts with light. Of course, it dims the more uh, layers you add because there, there's less surface compared to the bulk, but it's always there. The inner states, you can show that they form, let us say, a potato experimentally um, with one main peak and um, a strong shoulder. You can actually use this, uh, or you can think of using this for characterization. Of course, this is a very approximate model, but just to show you what one can glean from this kind of uh, this line of thought, we can look at the uh, the absorption spectrum for the the pentan layer, and we can say, well, qualitatively, the peak from the inner state is mostly a potato. It's not easy to resolve, but we can actually resolve the surface peak. These are like 0.1 eV apart. So if we integrate out this if we integrate this potato and compare its oscillator strength to this peak, then we can guesstimate the number of layers through a formula like this, which you can derive from the tight binding. If you do this here, we find that they are, they are between 5 and 5.6 layers, which is not bad because there are 5. And if you refine the model, probably you can do better. I'd like to end this by showing the comparison with the initial calculations. So these are the the, the, this is, these are the double of multiplets, if you will, the excitonic eigenstates for two, three, and five layers of boron nitride, the ones which we discussed before. And in the pental layer, I think the results uh, are really, I don't want to say spectacular, but show really the, um, how much uh, the, the surface states they couple. The lowest bound sets are really confined on the surfaces, while here you have basically a uh, linear chain um, inner states. So I've talked theory a lot, 
perhaps let us spare a word for the real world. I mentioned before that um, exon dispersion is very important when we want to discuss uh, the luminescence of bulk HBN. Uh, this because um, bulk BN has indirect excitons. I will not go into the details of this, this measurement. It suffices to know that uh, the lowest bound exciton in, in bulk BN is indirect. It's around this energy. And um, it can therefore give rise to phonon replicas, which are optically allowed and give rise to these peaks. So this is where this, this cathode luminescence spectrum of bulk comes from theoretically, if you will. Again, detailed discussions of this are available elsewhere. Now, there's a very interesting experiment which has been done um, by uh, Hue at, uh, at Al, uh, where they they look at, uh, at, at uh, BN flakes of varying thicknesses, and they lower the thickness um, and look at the cathode luminescence spectrum. And what you see for bulk, you see this characteristic four peak structure due to phonon replicas. But when you go down, you see that this down in thickness, you see that this structure goes away and is replaced instead by one peak, which was not there before, and which does not seem to have replicas. So the interpretation, the, the, the experimental interpretation that they give is that this is likely to be actually the surface state because it appears when you uh, lower the thickness and disappears afterwards and seems direct. Of course, this is not a smoking gun, but I like to show this to, to, to show that these, these discussions are, are not academic. Uh, having these models, I think, really helps uh, to understand what is going on uh, and not just to, you know, to compare to a B initial uh, and stay in the, the ivory theoretical tower. So, with this, um, I'd like to briefly conclude. Um, what we've done, what we've shown is that the bezels better equation for, for BN uh, can be mapped into a relatively simple type binding congruity problem, both for single and for multi-layers. And this is a tool which allows for the discussion of symmetries, the discussion of phases, which I think are crucial to understand really uh, excitonic wave functions. And uh, they give access, they give cheap access uh, numerically to excitonic band structure, which is otherwise costly to calculate. For multi-layers, uh, which are even more, even more challenging to compute up initial, we've seen that very simple uh, models can be derived from the full-time binding um, calculation. And we, op we obtained an almost parameter-free description of the, the splitting of the lowest bound excitation states there. Now, of course, there's much to do. Um, I'd like in particular to mention uh, this part on the right. Um, there are lots of people here who develop uh, linear order methods for real space. Um, what we have is a tight binding model for, for excitons. So there are many questions, hanging questions, such as the scattering of excitons from defects, from surfaces, if maybe they are created there by a laser spot, um, which might be solved by time evolving the states, or maybe by looking at their, at their diffusion. And with the real space model at our disposal, this is something that is possibly within reach. Very last, but certainly not very least, I'd like to mention all the, the collaborators because, of course, this is not, uh, I mean, you've seen a lot of what you've seen has been done with, with others. Um, people from the University of Luxembourg, uh, which did most of the, the initial calculation, which you've seen in this talk, and also people from, uh, from Monera in Paris who led most of the groundwork for the, the type binding model and really drove, I think, the theoretical developments in this direction, especially Francois de Castel, who uh, sadly passed away um, last year and really drove, I think, a lot of this project. There are papers, but I prefer to end on the people. Thank you. Okay, since I have the microphone, I can... Uh... Can applaud you thank you so much it was a very very clear very interesting presentation and and uh, i think the model is also is terrific and definitely uh, that would be nice to implement it for looking at the diffusion so i have i have a lot of questions but um let me see people raising hands or i'm not raising hands so i by the way i put in the chat uh 
the direct access to the PhD, uh, the PDF um, file of the PhD of Thomas. So you can you can have it. Uh, so okay, Isaac is asking. So let me try to see if I can give you a uh, lot to talk. Okay, Isaac, please. Okay, so do you hear me right? Yeah. I don't... yeah okay. Well, yeah, so very nice presentation. I uh, have a couple of questions. The first is uh, how your models, I mean, could be easy to kind of uh, implement your models in carbon-based uh, biconjugated systems, some similar like graphene, because of course, everything that you spoke about relies on the fact that the um, conduction and the valence band belong to these different lattices, to nitrogen and boron. So how easy would it be to translate this to graphene? I mean, could it be complicated or, or easier? So or? It, it, is, it, it would be extremely complicated because as you have said, uh, the model relies on the existence of a gap and graphene famously has none. Uh, so graphene is basically the, the exact situation where the approximations we made do not apply. Um, and what, what about some carbon still pi conjugated, uh, but with a gap? So let's say like, you know, uh, graphene and ribbons, for instance, they, they, they are based on like, like pure carbon, but they have a gap. Would those be easier or still? Mm -hmm. So it depends very much on the band structure. To be more precise, what really makes the model work is the separation of the, um, how to put this, the, um, the geometrical separation of the excited and, um, and, and ground states, if you will. Um, in other words, things work very nicely because the Vanier functions are simple. To lowest order, they are just the atomic orbitals. I suspect in the mostly carbon system, what happens is that the Vanier functions mostly exists uh, between the carbon atoms, and this makes things complicated. Um, maybe one can do something, but probably it will not be very nice to go through. Uh, so okay. I, I, I'm afraid this is a, a Okay, I, I, and, and the second question is, uh, because I think you also mentioned that, uh, well, but, okay, but maybe this is just something, a particularity of the hexagonal boronite that the uh, these optical transitions were lower than the band gap because you are actually creating localized states. No, this this. Uh, this band, is no? um, so. This is not particular to boron nitride at all. Um, the let me perhaps go back. So in, uh, in graphene, well, in graphene or in a let's say conductive system, this also happens. So, so, so sorry. What do you? So I mean, hexagonal boron nitride is an insulator, yes. right? So yes, I mean, yes, yes. So, so in a in a kind of metallic system like graphene, you also kind of get this thing. Well, graphene is a, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, these these states that you get uh, like within within the band gap are yes. are very localized, right? I guess. No? So they are localized after a fashion. The thing is, um, these are two body states. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to plot them, uh, as you've seen. Um, mm. But they are localized in the sense that the electron hole relative coordinate is localized. But they are not localized in the sense that the electron hole pairs are over the whole crystal. See, it's, it's kind of like the, the hydrogen atom. It's localized in the sense that the electron and the proton stick close together, but the, the wave function for the, 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 let's say, the center of mass coordinate is a plane wave. It's everywhere. It's the same for excitons. Okay, so so the, the the pair actually can actually is delocalized, but it's just that the the hole and the electron are always together, something like that. Yeah, that does that's pretty much it. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, well, yeah. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, Jose, do you have a question? You raise your hand. Okay. Jose, okay. <laughs> I love to talk. Yes, that's it. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yeah, Jose. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my question is similar to 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 Isaac, but more focus on on the TMDs. Mm -hmm. So in the TMDs, you have a band structure that is quite uh, similar to the hexagonal boron nitride, but 
the orbitals are all located in the metal, at least in the H phase. So, and basically the, when you look into the bands, one is basically P and the other one is D. So in this scenario, do you foresee the possibility to using these methods to study the excitons in the transition metal decalcogenized in the H phase? In, sorry, in which phase? In, in real space. In the semiconducting phase. Um, I, okay. Well, so a model in a similar spirit exists uh, actually for, for TMDs. Um, the more complicated band structure makes things a bit more delicate. Um, you probably could do it, uh, but you'd have to, let's say, lean much more heavily on perturbation theory. Um, it will not be as clean as it is in, uh, in BN. Um, but let's say theoretically, it can be done. Um, the question, of course, is how accurate it's going to be as soon as you want to go beyond uh, the, the most simple um, electron, the, the most simple, uh, let's say, uh, spectroscopic quantity. Especially stacking uh, might be delicate because there you'd have to take into account the decalcogenides and uh, this, this makes things, uh, this makes matters complicated. But let's say in the spirit, it's possible. All right, all right, thank you. Yeah, uh, just, just as a, as a follow-up, the, um, the fact that um, in, uh, when you, you stack two different transition metal decalcogenides, you can create this interlayer excitons, it means that the hole and the electron lives on the different layers. And these excitons are extremely long lived. Probably uh, in this situation, there should be some equivalent type banding formulation uh, as you found in, in HBN, right? Because HBN is really the stability is also, your, your model is, is, is accurate because uh, as you've shown, uh, um, electron and holes um, are mainly populated the uh, sublattice and nitrogen or sublattice boron. So in the case of interlayer excitons, uh, do you think that, um, that, that suggests that such a model should be possible to develop? Uh, okay, so I mean, just one thing about TMDs, the, the, mo the, the model in a similar spirit I was talking about is, is, is yeah. in this paper. Mm -hmm. um, then for the internal excitons, well, I mean, you. I, I first want to make clear that you can capture them uh, without any issue in HBN with the tight binding model. Uh, tight binding model captures interlayer, intralayer. This makes no difference. Um, can you capture them in um, in, in other systems uh, in TMDs? Mm, I would give a similar answer. The, the problem lies in precisely de describing the, the hoppings between the two layers. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, if the only thing you want to do is to describe the interior excitons and you don't want to couple the two layers, you just want your exciton to you know, be there, um, this is not really difficult to do, at least in the, in, in the Vani model, for example, this has been done. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But, uh, yeah. Okay. Um... I have plenty of questions. So people, I don't know that I see David uh, who is an experimentalist or Gemma also experimentalist. Stephen, I and I don't know you, but if you, you have some question from experimentalists, do not hesitate <laughs> to make the things more uh, you know, practical or realistic. My question, well, so you showed two, two different cases, which is very interesting. The case of direct exciton and the case of the indirect exciton. In the case of direct excitons, the the bond structure you, you showed and so which correspond to the absorption spectrum is the fact that excitons are, uh, exciton, exciton states are absolutely no dispersive, they're dispersionless, almost like a discrete state. However, when you mention the indirect exciton, here you, you, you show that even the calculation um, showed display different type of bonds and you, you even qualified them like, um, uh, kind of uh, high, uh, large uh, effective mass and weakly dispersive exciton, indirect exciton, 
bonds related to some kind of scattering, okay, because you need to, to have a K uh, variation. And the other case you say is that there is a very strongly dispersive uh, excitonic bonds, which will be related to um, Coulomb interaction and, and especially the section spot that you, you mentioned is repulsive. Is it correct? Is, it, is my summary okay? Uh, I might have been perhaps a bit unclear. Okay. Uh, I'm confused. Uh, maybe you are referring yes. to this kind of, uh, of plots. Yes. Okay, yeah. so um, I think maybe the confusion comes sadly from the way we usually depict excitons on the band structure, because yeah. you can't really do this because excitons are, are, are two body things. Mm -hmm. While band structures are for one body, uh, one body quantities, yeah. so we usually draw them as lines, but these lines they're just energy. So um, the direct excitons they correspond to the excitons at gamma. So all the spectrum from single AHBN, for example, which is has direct, which is um, whose lowest energy excitons are direct, comes from simply this um, this mm -hmm. line, if you wish. Mm -hmm. This is the first peak. This this is the second peak, etc. Now you can compute exciton dispersion for any any system. It's just that if it turns out that the exciton dispersion is indirect, by which we mean that the indirect excitons are lower in energy, mm -hmm. we expect that it's probably these ones which will contribute, which will uh, which you will see in luminescence. Yeah, because there there are scattering effects. Blah blah blah. Um, now. Concerning the, the effective mass of the, the, the motion of the excitons, the effective mass, uh, well, you can read an exciton effective mass on, a, on an exciton band structure pretty much like you can read an electron effective mass on, a, on an electronic band structure. This, if you will, is, is, is the, the two body analog of, uh, of the one body electron band structure. No, yeah, I understand. I understand, Thomas. The point is that here, so you have different. You you, you mentioned them: exciton one, exciton two, mm -hmm. and and that's that's a bond structure which you derive from your effective one body type banding model, right? Yes. So you have yes. your your hole, and and if I I'm reading the bonds, I will I will tell me if I'm wrong, but I will say that your your hole that you have localized, and then the electrons density around that you plot. It's like this hole, if you change in K, you will move along the bond, but the, the, the way you move the, fast, the, the fastest or the slowest re related to the fact that this uh, uh, hole is surrounded by the, the electron cloud that is uh, you know, kind of making the, the pair. So, mm -hmm. so this bond is really like, through the dispersion, it tells you all the, 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 the pair will move, but on an effective model, is it correct? Uh, you can probably put it like this. Q usually think of as the most the, the, um, the momentum of the center of mass of the exciton. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I mean this is similar to what you said. Uh, okay. And yes, I mean similar to the electron band structure. This this tells you how you how excitons move in a way in a perfect crystal. Exactly. So now the question is the following: because very important if we want to move. I mean if as you said. Uh, 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 the conclusion, if we want to look at the time evolution of a wave, an excitonic wave function, um, there is, I mean, and we want to implement this into, let's say, a very large supercell in which we could position, let's say, carbon impurity in low density, for instance, okay, that's yeah. connect with the with a, with a question of, of Isaac, or is that, uh, um, let's say that the basis that you have developed will remain uh, strongly dominating. And then this carbon impurity in a, in a big supercell, we will play like a perturbation. They will not close the gap. They will not change the, 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 the main features of the type banding model or whether they will introduce, if you look at the evolution of the wave function, they will, they will uh, mimic the effect of disorder and introduce some scattering. But to, in order to move to this large scale, I think one of the very important questions is how delocalized are those excitons in your model? Because, and, and that's connected with your figure here, because if you have very dispersive um, uh, you know, bonds, I will, I will assume that this will also correspond to a very expanded uh, you know, uh, exciton in real space. Contrary, if you have a more uh, weakly dispersive and uh, like this exciton one, 
then somehow the excitant would be more localized in real space. So I don't remember exactly how do you qualify uh, the, 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 the nature of this exciton localization. And if you, you can you know, extrapolate um, somehow how large should be a, a supercell, uh, probably the, the exciton is, is, is totally delocalized, not really localized, right? But uh, uh, let's say most of the, of the weight of the exciton uh, might be mainly localized on, on some uh, limited spatial uh, window or something like that. How do you, you see my... Uh, well, again, it depends which localization you, you think about. Uh, I mean, if you, if you shine a laser spot on a, on a system, a laser spot is big, it's very big. Okay. So uh, there you, you excite basically all the, all the sample. Mm -hmm. um, but the ball radiuses remain uh, remain small, so the action on the hole remain closed. Mm -hmm. um, it's delicate to estimate the the exact uh, size you need uh, for the supercell. Um, one thing perhaps I should mention is that you you are not forced to use this uh, this hybrid basis to do the the scattering. Uh, you can also not construct the block, um, the electron, the electron hole block waves, okay, and just deal with a localized electron hole basis. Mm -hmm. This doubles the dimension of the crystal. Yeah, um, but you can perfectly write everything in there, and this might be the more natural basis actually to uh, to do diffusion. Okay, okay, yeah, good point. Because th there you can actually localize in a way. Yeah, but if okay. you really want to simulate a laser spot. These are big. Okay. So Isaac is back with a question. Isaac, I think. Do you do you, do you hear me? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, so no, I actually in the line of what the Stefan was saying. So, um, yeah, if we have like a perfect hexagonal boron nitride crystal, and then we actually have these, let's say, carbon defects or some or some sort of defect, uh, kind of dispersed in this perfect crystal. I mean, normally, in in when you do this kind of like with with tra electronic transport, right? You kind of try to capture the effect in the, in your tight binding model of that mm -hmm. defect, no? That 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 you may kind of extract from a DFT calculation of that defect or something like that, no? So you you say, okay, so this defect does a rise of the on-site energy or kills this whole thing or whatever, and then you apply this yeah. in your big thing, no? So. Could you foresee how easy it would be to, let's say, um, include these variations in the tight binding model of different defects, like a vacancy you know, of a nitrogen atom or uh, a replacement of a carbon atom, uh, sorry, of a nitrogen atom by a carbon atom? How easy it would be to actually include the effect of these defects in the tight binding model that represents this uh, exciton? Uh, dispersion. How is it would be to translate those de those defects in the dispersion of 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 the excitons to then actually do like uh, you know these large scale transport simulations of these excitonic particles? Could it be so, easy or it's just impossible to do? I mean, so I think it depends how uh, how well you want to describe the defect. If you just want to remove an atom, kill kill hoppings, uh, this is not hard. Uh, the way you would do this um, is you would stop there, basically. You would use this basis, this basis of localized uh, atomic orbitals. And then, I mean, you, you are working on the crystal lattice. So you just remove an atom if you want and modify the on-site. And then you recompute uh, the, the type binding Hamiltonian. Uh, if all you want is change an on-site, uh, Kill or change a hopping, this, this is easy to do. Okay. Um, okay. If now you want to, you know, have a charge defect uh, with some states which are inside the gap, the very realistic modelization of a defect, of course, is delicate because this changes the band structure. Uh, okay. But simple, you know, under some disorder, removing hoppings, this is easy to do. Okay. Okay. But okay. Yeah. But competitionally more expensive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Isaac. 
um, I was thinking also when you look at the at the, uh, the multi-layer case, mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe I don't know if you you've seen this in the literature. It's quite recent, but people have have, have found that when you have two layers of boron nitride, there could be some uh, ferroelectricity emerging because the this interaction between layers will will distort a bit um, boron and nitrogen. But but it, I mean, let, let's let's forget about this effect. I was just thinking that probably you your stacking was a kind of a Bernal type of symmetry, but but uh, why why not thinking about twisting the one on, on top of the other and maybe the exciton the excitonic property the exciton bond could be like very weird at some point. How do you think about it? Uh, I, I've, I've thought about this. I I think in fact there's there's work of this at Lem. There's work on this topic at LEM. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. they are not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. No, that's normal. But but they, they, are, they are taking this, uh, they do ab initio or they, or they can do it because you, do, you, you need to type banning. Maybe the supercell will become quite, quite, quite large. Oh, probably. But, uh, and, so, and, and, some, and some molecular dynamic would be important because we know that uh, already for the twist uh, by layer graphene, there are some intra layer uh, distortion that are fundamental. And that are not usually taken into account. Okay, we will discuss this uh, uh, maybe later. Um, um, yeah, yeah, just um, uh, okay. Another, uh, let's see, another question. Always people asking the same question. Well, what the other? The other just connect and they, they're just sleeping. Ask to unmute. Okay, Jose, you want to jump in? Ask to unmute, Jose. I don't know if you can talk. No, I think you can now. Jose. Jose. He raised his hand on accident. Ah, uh, okay. okay. But okay. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking about bilayer graphene. Mm -hmm. um, so if you apply a vertical electric field, then you open a gap. Yeah. And then also then the conduction and valence band are localized on one layer or the other. Um, so this seems like a nice candidate for applying your theory and model to as well. Um, what do you think? The problem, the problem is then what happens in plane. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Because in plane, the the, the Vanier functions are still between the atoms. So, uh, and if the Vanier functions are nice, perhaps. But the the problem is that having a gap in a way is not the only the only thing. If the um, uh, if the, the valence and the conduction band are completely muddled in plane, uh, you, you cannot do this, uh, this approximation, you see. There, there the gap occurs only in, in bilaographene, the gap occurs only because you have different potentials on the two layers. But inside the layers, the, the value functions are still completely smeared. Oh, okay. I thought they were like also localized on one sublattice or the other. I, not um, true. I mean, okay. maybe they are, if, 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 if they are, Fantastic, but okay. Uh, I mean, fantastic. Yeah, I have to have to double check this. I think if, if, if they are good, but uh, yeah, yeah, I see. Graphene is basically my arch nemesis, as you can. <laughs> no, no, but yeah, but sure. frankly, right. frankly, Thanks. frankly, yeah. that's a good question, uh, Aaron. Can you can you check because I'm also not really sure what you say. The sublattice degeneracy. Jose in. has an answer for this. Okay, Jose. Ah, ah Jose. Uh, now, hello, yeah, yeah, it works. So, well, I had a question. So, there was a question about the localization of the bilayer. Yeah. Well, I think they are localized uh, in sublattice also. Like, there is a at least for certain electric fields, I'm pretty sure about that. And it's under certain stack. Mm -hmm. Another story is when you twist it or if you change the stacking, then things might get a bit uh, different. Um, and I also have a question about, it seems that you uh, use or you require the Vanier function uh, as a potential input to develop your theory. So how, like, if you have the possibility to generate a set of vanier function for a given set of materials, how will you know if you can model the exciton in those 
materials using your theory? Uh, or do you foresee a way to, to know in advance if you have like 200 semiconductors that you have all the manier functions and then you want to see what are the exciton behavior? Do you see a way to discriminate between those systems that can be modeled and those that can't? You mean having only the Vanier functions? Yes, you have the Vanier function, uh, the symmetries, so, and the chemical composition. I mean, if, so if you know the Vanier functions, I'm tempted to say you're halfway there already. Uh, I'm not sure you need the type binding, but um, if you want to apply things as is, um, the best case scenario is if um, your Vanier functions are strongly centered uh, on the um, on the atomic positions, uh, this is what you need in a way. This is what makes things tick. Is that Vanier functions are, I mean, yeah, correspond well with the uh, the atomic orbitals. Um, and um, but I mean for the exciton because like Vanier function I type binding are are similar, but here you are also like working out a demanding model for the excitons, while mm. the Vanier function that I am referring to are the Vanier function for the electrons. Yes. Um, so the, 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 the thing is you, how, how do I, um, so to, to, to make them the, the machinery, the analytical machinery work, um, basically, uh, Going to here, yeah. yeah. You start with the uh, with the type binding, the electronic type binding Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. and what you do is that you proceed uh, in second order perturbation theory. Basically, you take the hopping as a perturbation to the gap. So, and, and things work out nicely geometrically because the uh, so both because this is indeed a perturbation and because um, the Vanier functions, if you will, uh, look a lot like the atomic orbitals. And this lets you then do this, uh, do this. But once you are there, you are done in a way. Uh, you, you don't need anything special, uh, but you can see that if the Vanier functions are super delocalized, for example, uh, this will probably become complicated uh, the assumption that the hoppings are weak is probably not very good. Uh, so all manner of difficulties will start to appear. But technically, I, I think if you have the Vanier functions, you, you could solve the beta salpeter equation starting from them. Uh, numerically, I so, don't think- So that based that on that, good. if you had the Vanier function for mm -hmm. carbon system, like by layer or affine, then there is no problem in a study excitons there. You have to construct the Hamiltonian, but the, the yeah you had the so, Hamil the Vanier Hamiltonian. The the thing is what, what what I mean is that you you can but this is this seems like the same as turning it a Benicio. You see what I mean? You I have see. The Vanier, you you have the you have computed the Vanier functions, then you use them to compute the electron hole interaction, and then you solve numerically. But then why do you need the you can make probably approximations, which are in the spirit of this type binding model. I mean, it's, it's kind of two-center approximation. Every, all that is done in quantum chemistry, for example. But what you're describing looks a bit to me like a, a quantum chemistry code. I see. I see. Thank you. So, okay. Um, so we have some. So let's see. Uh, Claudia, David, Gemma, Joaquin, Onurchan, Stefan. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you have a few seconds to raise your hand. <laughs> um, otherwise, so I don't see your hand raised. Oh, Isaac again. <laughs> okay, ask a question. Final question, then we'll make a, a break. Okay, thank you, Stefan. This is really my last question. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, just to follow up what you just mentioned uh, with, with, with Jose, uh that okay many of these properties actually can be obtained uh with with affinity you know so then yeah. my question maybe i missed something okay, in such a case sorry for but uh, i mean then what's the need i mean what what 
what do you actually get extra by these simplified models uh, that you cannot get with Appinitia? So you, you get two things. First, uh, this is computationally much less expensive. Okay. For example, computing the, the spectrum of the penta layer, this takes month. A, a month. Computer. Right. No, no, not, not a month, many. Uh, or this or took many months. Okay. Um, well, here you can, for example, you can study the splitting of the lowest, the, the main peak. Uh, you've seen the figure up to n equals 25 from type binding. This is done by uh, like this. Uh, so you can study larger systems, which is one of the main uh, draws of such techniques. What you can also do is you can extract uh, physical insight. You can extract the phases in case space, which is hard to do up initial. Uh, you can you can do analytical work, which you otherwise do not have access to up initial. So I think the value of such models is to, one is to guide the intuition uh, and also perhaps to guide the, the costly calculations that you actually have to do. Okay. Um, because this, this allows you to both and know what calculations to do and understand your calculations once you have done them. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I mean, I agree. And, and, and I think that if at some point, you know, uh, it could be added the defects, you know, which is actually that thing that you have when you do it large scale, that would be very nice because that's certainly something at large scales that you cannot do with Appinitio. So that would yes. give a lot of value to, to this model. You know? so, mm -hmm. Indeed. Anyway, thank you. Eh? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think we, we need a break, and Thomas <laughs> certainly more than we. Um, so, Thomas, we as we said, since you have something to do urgently concerning your return to Luxembourg, please take like uh, the time, like twenty minutes, half an hour. One, you. Once you solve that, you just uh, we just reconvene. You send me. Um, uh, a message and we reconvene with Aaron and Jose to discuss uh, possible collaboration. Okay. Okay. So then for the other, thank you for, for joining and, um, and have a good hot summer in Barcelona or in the, or maybe you go to Pyrenees or somewhere else. Thank you for joining. Bye bye.